we are live on the Gamification Revolution webinar series. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome from a very cold and sunny New York City. It's almost the beginning of spring. I can taste it. I have the taste of spring upon me, and that's why I'm wearing a post-St. Patrick's Day, very spring-like green. And my guest today is the amazing Yukai Chow. Hello, Yukai. Hello, Gabe, and all the good people out there. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. So exciting to have you. And for those of you who are just joining us for the first time, welcome. If you've been here before, welcome back. You'll need to log in to the system with one of your social media accounts to be able to post questions, ask questions, come on camera if you want to ask you, Kai or I, any questions that you might have over the next little while. Log in and then click one of those buttons that say question or camera and ask. You can also ask things in the chat that are happening next uh, nearby the screen, nearby the video, uh, and we'll be sure to answer those questions as best we can over this next little while. If you don't know, June 10th through the 13th, Gamification Summit, gsummit.com. We're coming back again for another great year of exciting and amazing content with uh, all kinds of experts, including Yukai, who will be giving a uh, what we call a hands-on lab, which is a new kind of mini workshop that we've uh, announced for the first time this year. And he'll be doing one uh, talking about his frameworks and his thinking about gamification, how to apply those things to uh, you know what you have to do. So join us, 50 plus other speakers, all kinds of different things talking about engagement, gamification. Really, really super exciting. And so let's dig in a little bit with Yukai because I know that we want to talk about it. So Yukai, tell us first and foremost about this concept called octalysis. Many of the people watching us uh, today have heard of you. Obviously, many of the folks uh, you know have heard of the octalysis a little bit. Tell us what octal what octalysis is and how you came to develop it. Okay, so octalysis is a game of gamification design framework, and it's used to really design what I call the the essence of a game, which is what, instead of the the game mechanics, the game elements that that you see in games, it really goes into the core about why are games fun. They're not fun because they have zombies or ninjas or whatnot, because a lot of games have zombies and they're not fun. So it deeps, dick, uh, deeps it digs deeper into the core drives of you know what element within our psychology that pushes people forward. And this is a framework where I published about a year and a half, two years ago. It was really picked up, was translating to, to I think about twelve different languages, and uh, you know I get a lot of invitations to talk about it. And the reason why I started Octalysis, so I've been working in gamification since 2003. Before it was a lonely passion, people just thought I was trying to create excuses to play more games. Uh, but I stuck to it because I really believed in it. And you know, as, as time goes by, some, I was running a few different startup companies on, in the gamification space. It wasn't really coined that back then. Um, and I would also do some consulting advisory for other companies. And I would go into the company, I'd be like, you guys should do this pew, 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 and say all these things and they're like you Kai, you know how did you come up with the stuff i'm like i don't know i guess you just need a lot of experience playing games and running businesses maybe um so i wanted good gamification design to be more scalable i wanted more people to design things properly and actually make experiences fun not just add game elements and mechanics into a process but more importantly making it engaging exciting and fun so I, again, I published it about two years ago, and the core of, of octalysis, it's called octalysis because it's analysis based on an octagon shape. And at the center of octalysis, there are eight core drives. And I believe that everything you do in game or out of a game is based on one or, one or more of these eight core drives. And, uh, and it builds a lot of design uh, thinking and concept based on those. And that's why it's called octalysis, and that's the history of it. So I just put this up on the screen, which many people can now see, the Octalysis actual visuals um, to help kind of underline this. I mean, there's so much thinking and detail that's gone into your, your kind of framework. So can you take us kind of through the different elements of Octalysis, uh, help us understand a little bit more about you know, what they are and, and what each one of these sections actually means? Sure. So the first, uh, the first core drive of Octalysis is Epic, Meaning, and Calling. So that is like, um, you know, you're doing something because you're part of something bigger than yourself. So that's just, this is like why people contribute to Wikipedia. Not to make more money, not even to build your resumes, but because you feel like you're protecting humanity's knowledge. Something bigger than yourself. And so in games, oftentimes you see that, right? It's like 
there's some huge thing happening. The world's about to end, and somehow you're just you're the only person qualified to save the world, and you want to do that. The second can core drive is development. About that before we before we right. leave the subject of meaning for a second, okay. So can we give something meaning, deeper meaning, mm -hmm. that doesn't inherently have it? So if we're applying octalysis, for example, we're applying this framework to something like a loyalty program for a subway sub uh, sub yeah. you know submarine sandwich shop. Can we bring some of that deeper meaning in? How do we do that? Yeah, so there's two type of epic meaning callings. One are more fantasy based, so just making you believe that something's more exciting, like you're being a wizard, or whatnot. And then you know, depending on the context, context is everything. Some people enjoy that. You know, uh, Sebastian Turding said that you know when he was walking home and he see cracks in the ground, he made it fun because he pretended that he was a volcano scientist trying to avoid the the lava, right? That's that's a type of small epic meaning and calling is doing important work and it's dangerous but so and that is just some fantasy stuff it makes you believe that then there are other things like like true epic meaning and calling like you're actually changing the world like kiva.org now one example i really like about this is for instance um waze w a z e the gps app a lot of people come to me and say hey you kind you know our our startup our company we just build a tool it's an app you know there's no real bigger meaning we're not saving the world or anything so how do we do epic meaning and calling? And uh, so what Waze does, which I thought was genius, uh, and is especially when you start to use Waze a few years ago, when you first download it, it'll show you an image. On the left side of the image, there's a huge snake monster. And this snake monster is made of a, a road with cars stuck on it. And this monster is called traffic. On the right side of the image, there's like little Wazers, knights, you know, with swords and shells trying to fight fight this, uh, this big monster together. And uh, below, it'll have one tagline that says, be traffic together. So when you think about a GPS, you usually think, oh, it's, it's very functional. You turn, live, turn left, turn right, you get to your destination. But with Waze, you're not just driving to your workplace. You're not just getting to your destination. You're helping humanity beat this monster called traffic. And no one likes traffic, right? And the way to beat it is to drive with Waze on because you're contributing information to the pool. People are learning from it. Um, now, what's amazing about Epic Meaning and Calling, again, it's because it's something bigger than yourself, when Waze fails, because it's user-generated, there's been like two or three times it took me to the wrong destination, right? And you think that, oh, the only purpose of a GPS is to get you to your destination. So when it fails in that core competency, most people will say that, oh, this is a piece of crap. I'm going to delete it. Now, the powerful thing about Epic Meaning and Calling is when a lot of times when, the, when it takes people to the wrong destination, some people panic and instead of deleting it, they say, oh no, the map is broken. I need to go fix it. See, how right. powerful is that? You know, instead of calling your, you a piece of crap, they panic because you make them believe of something higher. It's not about what I want. Am I comfortable? It's, it's about that higher vision of we're working together to, to beat this traffic monster, to make traffic more bearable. And so when that vision cracks a little, people struggle and they go and try to fix as quickly as possible. And Apple right. understands this, right? Yeah. So that's, that's very powerful, right? It raises people's tolerance. It gives you more bandwidth to do different things and creates a kind of engagement with them that, uh, you know, that might transcend the classic kind of uh, pay for play. What about empowerment? Yeah. What's, what's empowerment about? So empowerment of creativity and feedback is... I think we may have lost Yukai. I, I will say for my part, I think one of the things that uh, is really powerful to me about when I think a lot about that kind of epic meaning is not just the issue of, you know, being able to, uh, you know, get people to accept more errors and mistakes in a particular process or experience. Uh, because, you know, in the example of ways, you know, I, I'm still pretty irritated when the directions are wrong. I actually think the more important thing is you know, what the user feels like, um, you know, is important or meaningful to them is being actualized through the system, through the actual experience of what it is that they're doing. So interacting with the system themselves, feeling that epic meaning and then the system giving that epic meaning actually just makes them feel better about themselves and feel better about the world. So in a way, it's, it's almost like, uh, you know, when you do give them something good or meaningful, you're sort of turbocharging, uh, you know, the value and meaning that they might get out of that. And that is, in and of itself, a, a very, very powerful thing, even if we don't have the errors uh, piece of it to deal with. Welcome back, Yukai. I am back. I, uh, awesome. Welcome back. I'm so here. we were I just about experience. to share. 
It's all good. We, as long as we can get you back, we're happy. Yeah, empowerment. <laughs> yes. Tell us about that. Okay, so empowerment of creativity and feedback is actually the third core drive. So we're going a little out of order, which is fine. The orders actually matter a lot, but um, empowerment of creative feedback is kind of like Lego, where you give users the basic building blocks, and there's an infinite amount of ways uh, to use your creativity to try different combinations, strategies, see feedback, and go back and adjust. And that's a very engaging process. So is empowerment something that, like, people are actively looking for in their lives? Is it the kind of thing, are we, are we meeting an unmet need when we use empowerment in the context of gamification? Or is it something yes, that we, we, by definition, have to do in order to get where we need to go? So empowerment is really the creativity drive. So it's, it's basically says people like to make choices, meaningful choices. They don't like to be forced to do anything. They like to choose between A or B. They like to use their creativity, try different combinations. And I think in all of us, we have a longing for all of these core drives, just like, you know, we have, we, everyone wants to be appreciated, which is social influence relatedness. Um, you know, I think it's in all of us, unfortunately, and I think you talked about, about, about that a lot, in our society, we don't get a lot of opportunities to utilize, to, to, to obtain these, these core drives, these longings, and that's what games do so well. They, they give you what you really, what you really want. And uh, now what we're trying to really bring what we've learned from games into the real world so that the real world is more rewarding and, uh, and exciting. So we had a question, by the way, in the meantime, uh, from Dutch, which was kind of an interesting question, which is about the order of the drives. I know I, I jumped out of order by going right to empowerment, but how does the order of these different drives actually matter? What's, what's the meaning behind that? OK, so a few, few different things. Um, the, you know, later, you see that the top, there's a difference between the top and the bottom core drives, and this is why it's on an octagon shape. So the top ones, I call them white hat gamification core drives, and the bottom one are called black hat gamification core drives. So the top ones are ones that make you feel powerful. You know, it makes you feel like I'm in control of my life. I'm using my creativity. I'm being a part of something bigger. I'm improving myself. I'm achieving mastery. Whereas the bottom one, it's still very, very powerful in motivation, but it's more on the obsession, you know, addiction side, where if you feel like you're always doing something because you don't want to lose something, you don't, you don't know what's going to happen next, or just because you can't have it. You know, it's, it's going to be very, very powerful and motivating to do something, but sometimes it leaves a bad taste in your mouth. It's because, and in the long run, when you can leave the system, you will want to. And uh, so that, that's my example. So that's what the, the problem Zynga is going through. Like they figured out how to do all, a lot of these black hat game techniques. So their metrics look great, addiction, you know, monetization, user sign up, sharing. But because a lot of players don't feel good playing Zynga games, when they can leave the system, they will want to, which is why I believe they have they show stagnant results. Now that's black and white hat. Then there's left and right brain core drives, and this is not brain science, just symbolic. So the left brain core drives are more things like ownership, you know, uh, logic, calculations, and the right brain core drives are more about you know creativity, social, and the like. And left brain core drives just tend to be more extrinsic. You're doing something for a, a goal, and we've talked a lot about intrinsic, extrinsic on your show, or you guys have. Um, but it's like if you're doing something just because you want to gain something, you can't have it, or you want to achieve a goal, that's extrinsic. So the, the task itself could be really boring. You know, you, you could be digging crap, and that's a crappy job. And someone says, oh, I'll give you $10,000 for every crap you dig out. They're like, oh, wow, easy money, and you're excited. But it's, it's completely extrinsic. And intrinsic is stuff that you would actually pay money to do. You know, you don't need to, to get a reward by enjoying using your creativity. You don't need a reward to hang out with friends. You don't necessarily need a reward to be in the suspense of unpredictability. In fact, in a casino, it's the opposite, right? You know you predictably will lose money. You're statistically screwed, and that's why the casino makes so much money. But people will come out saying, oh, yeah, I lost $200, but, but it was so much fun. Because throughout, you thought you could win, you could win, and that's the fun part. And that so, that, so, the order, so the order in placement is very important because you want to understand what your, what your goals are for your design and think about, am I trying to go for long-term engagement or short-term urgency? Am I trying to be, make it extrinsic, which is a lot easier to design. Most gamification examples I've seen out there, you know, it's, it's, they like to do extrinsic because it's just, hey, let's, let's show, give them a goal, give them a reward. And, and they'll go for it, you know, that's easy. But I usually recommend, and you want to balance between all of it, and it depends on your goal. But a lot of times it's good to think about how do you make the task itself more interesting instead of adding a layer of, you know, what really is a meta game 
on top uh, out around the boring activity. Sure. So, so I'm sorry so then, that I took us. I'm sorry that I took us out of order. Let's go back. <laughs> let's jump back into your order and keep going around your doc because right. it's and fascinating, this is, right? Okay. And the, the order, the number order is important just because when you get to more advanced octalysis, you know, just to save time, it will, it'll do thing. We'll say like core drive two injectors core drive four, that injectors core drive seven, and that kills core drive eight. You know, and then if you if you if you learn this out of order, you'll get confused. And okay. I mean, if you did, you you might get confused too. So let's go, <laughs> yeah. So let's let's assume that we're minimizing confusion. Let's go back. What was core drive number two right. that we skipped over? Core drive number two is development accomplishment. Which is the core drive that says you're engaged because you feel like you're improving, you're leveling up, you're achieving mastery. And this is where a lot of the points and badges are. The feedback metric shows you, hey, you're getting, a, you're, you're, you're moving a level higher, you have trophies or whatnot, and allows people to see progress. So that's core drive two. Okay. So, um, so this is the one that we, uh, we follow a lot around. And, and by the way, just as a quick note, folks are uh, interested in how to move the graphic around on your screen. If you just move your mouse in the middle of it, you'll see a kind of option to drag the window and you can just click and drag and move the octalysis graphic around if it's uh, in your way and, and minimize it if you don't want to look at it. I just want it to be up there so it's people can see the visual reference. It's a tough choice. Uh, I'm choosing having it cover your face or the chat box. It's, it's, I can't choose. Cover my face. Cover my face. Uh, we all know what I look like. There's no, nothing new to see here. Um, okay, so accomplishment, you know, we spend a lot of time on this subject, right? To your point, you're talking about the badges and progress systems and stuff. A lot of uh, the design for engagement is focused around this particular part of that. Can you talk to, yes. do you think that's the right balance? Is it the wrong balance? Why are we so, why is accomplishment so high on our list of things that we think about? It's because it's the easiest to do. Um, and, and again, it's, um, it also makes people feel good. So, so again, it's white hat, so it makes people feel good. So it's more politically correct, it's more legitimate, and it's easy because it's extrinsic. So it's easy for me to just show you, oh, I'll give you a counter and show you how you're doing, right? It's hard for me to implement creativity. It's hard for me to create something to make you figure out, oh, how can I put meaningful choices into the activity? How can I utilize what my, my uniqueness, right? It's so, 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 but if you, but if you want to just go with um, the extrinsic motivation stuff, the left brain core drive, scarcity is controversial. Scarcity means that I'm taking away from you. So just so you would want it even more. And that's not as PC oftentimes in cases. So, you know, core drive two, it's just easy to design. Oh, oh, another huge reason is most of the gamification platforms out there focus on this, on this core drive. You know, they are, <clears throat> They're, they're, they're basically engines that allow you to keep track of your activities, which, which really help you emphasize core drive too. And, and this is another reason why. So great, okay, awesome. Uh, so let's move on, what's number four? Number four is ownership and possession. So it moves in a lightning shape like Harry Potter's head. Of course it does. Um, ownership, of course it does. Yes, everything, everything moves in like a Harry Potter's head. Kind of sounds weird, but ownership possession is the, uh, the core drive that says because you feel like you own something, you want to improve it, you want to protect it, and you want to get more of it. So this deals with things like virtual goods, virtual currencies. It's it's the core drive that makes them want to accumulate wealth, and um, it also deals with things that are more abstract. Like if you spend a lot of time customizing your profile, you feel more ownership to it, and so it's harder to quit. Or you customize your avatar. Or there's an engine that's constantly learning about your preferences. You know, it's like recommendation engine. It's like, oh, this is my system. This is unique to me. No one, even if there's a better product out there, they don't under, they don't know me. This one knows me. So you would stay on a product, and that's the core drive. And, and so we know that this is quite important, especially in like virtual economy type designs, right? We, there's a lot of effort put into uh, customization, ownership, personalization, right? Another word that comes up here a lot. Um, do you do you think this is different? Is this particular one uh, extra different culturally? What have you seen in terms of the difference here uh, between different countries or age groups around their interest in this personalization and ownership question? Um, so the the output is different. Just like you could have the exact same game, but having ponies jump around over a bridge versus a ninja jumping over a bridge, it appeals to different demographics. But the the game design, the core of it is the same. So so I think there's like a collection set. The collection set is something where you know when when you win a prize, the prize is not the full reward. It's a, a, a portion of it. So you start collecting more and more of it. 
most people, when they, you know, at the beginning, they don't really care about these, these collection sets, these pieces. But once they get, you get over 50, 60 percent, then people naturally want to complete that. And I think that's, that's uh, within everyone. Like, I that is just people like to collect different things. Like some, maybe some uh, older generation, they like to collect stamps. And then there's the baseball card collecting people. And then there's the Pokemon card collecting people. So I don't think it really differs between demographics. Now, it depends, again, it's all about context, about What's the company? What's the product? What are, why are you here? Why are you in the system for? Um, but it's important to think through very carefully because a lot of companies think, oh, if we have points, we have this virtual economy and it'll be fun and engaging. But they have to realize that a virtual economy is something very, very complex. You have to calculate the labor in. You know, Adam Smith says all value comes from labor. Yeah. What's the labor in? What's the tradability? And what's the reward out? And so, like, the central government knows that if you increase interest rate by 3%, you know, banks will do this, insurance companies right. will do this, consumers well, that, will do this, it'll change everything. The right? summary, but companies think, oh. Yeah, yeah, economics is hard, right? And everybody, this is like definitely something that we gloss over. Um, mm -hmm. But you're right, it's super, super difficult. So if I'm following your thunderbolt though, or your lightning bolt, right, that, 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 it should be social influence next, right? Ah, you got you're clever. Yeah, okay, <laughs> tell us about social influence. So social influence related is fairly straightforward. It's basically what you do based on what other people think, do, or say. And it also it deals with things like mentorship, envy, group quests, you know, gifting. Um, it also deals with relatedness, which, uh, which is stuff like nostalgia. Like if you see a product that reminds you of your childhood, you have a higher chance of buying the product. If you, um, if you meet someone from the same hometown, you have a higher chance of striking up a deal with them. So that, that relatedness is also a very powerful motivator to, for people to, uh, to, to take actions. Do we always, in this particular case, when we're thinking about designing gamified experience around social influence, do we always want to use the existing social graph? Does it matter that this social influence existed before the experience we create? Or is our goal to create a new kind of connection between people and social influence? Uh, both. I mean, I'm assuming everyone who would who you actually get an interface with through their product, your experience. They've had social, the social influence in their past. Again, I believe everything you do is based on one or more of these eight core drives. So this deals with parenting, it deals with negotiating, go to school education, all that stuff. So, so when a person starts to use your experience, your product, whatever it is, um, the, obviously they have a long history of social influence and relatedness. So there's a few different things you can do. You can, I, you can try to utilize that. Most people are very protective of their past social, social graph and all that stuff. You can try to utilize that, but then you have to be very compelling in terms of why this is useful for you and also useful for your friends because I don't want to be, no one wants to be the guy who's the, who's the asshole and, and, and sacrifice all his friends to get something out of a game. Um, but then it's usually better or it's easier or better to, to build more social influence related into a game. So I'll give you an example, and I know we're moving in the schedule. So quick example is, I don't know if you know the game Parallel Kingdoms, and you know, they're, they're a small game, and the graphics are very mediocre, but they make a lot of money. So I was trying to, I just wanted to go in and see, okay, what makes them so successful, you know, check out the game mechanics. I planned to play the game for two hours, but upon 40 minutes, they said, oh, you have been assigned a mentor, he'll message you when he logs in. So the mentor comes on, he gives me, first he like, he gives me a lot of his old stuff that he doesn't need. I'm like, wow, these are all the cool things that I couldn't get by myself. And then, then I felt bad. I didn't want to quit anymore because if I, if he gave me stuff and I quit, <clears throat> then I'd be a huge disappointment from him, appointment to him. And then he started taking me through all these, these dungeons, killing monsters quickly. And I couldn't kill these monsters. And he just like, and everything dies. I'm like, wow, I want to be like him one day. So I don't even care about the game, but I, but if you try something, if you try to do something, and you couldn't do it and someone does it easily, you have that natural tendency of, I want to be like that a bit. But the biggest thing is, I'm like, wow, this is a high level player. He's not, he should be in the high level dungeon. He's wasting time on me right now, one or two hours. I would be a huge disappointment if I quit the game right now. So, so I ended up staying on and playing and I joined his kingdom. I helped him out for like one or two months instead of two hours, which might have been the plan. And this is a social influence that's built into a game, right? It's, it's saying, now you have a mentor and that mentor gave you some of his time and, and you appreciate that. So you don't want to quit anymore. That's so, so you want to think about how do you build these things into your product or experience? So uh, very interesting. So Sasha's asking, 
whether Octalysis is a tool for human motivation in general and not just for gamification. And I think I know your answer to this, but I, I'm interested in hearing what you have to say about that. Okay, so I personally believe the, 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 good, the real name for gamification is what I call human-focused design as opposed to function-focused design. So most systems are function-focused. You know, it, it assumes people in the system will do their work and then optimizes for efficiency output. So that's like a factory, right? Factory, you assume people do work and you try to get the most out of them. Now, human-focused design remembers that people in the system have feelings and you know, insecurities, reasons why they do or do not want to do something, and so it optimizes for that. So it's kind of like a theme park where you design it to be really, really fun, and then you can predict that people will automatically want to, to line up for hours and hours just so they can enjoy the experience. Now, the reason why we call it gamification is because the, the gaming industry is the first to master human-focused design because games have no other purpose than to please the human inside. Right? You have to do your taxes, you have to do your homework. They could suck and you still have to grind it and do it. Games, you never have to play a game. So you know, they're always trying to figure out how to make you want to do it. And so because they spend decades, even centuries, depending on how you qualify a game, figuring out what appeals to the human mind to make, it, to make the mind delightful and engaged, now we're learning from games. And so we call it, uh, we call it gamification. And uh, so, so so I think gamification and human motivation are very much intertwined together because gamification is using, or games are using human-focused design in, in entertainment, whereas gamification is using human-focused design in everything else in the world. In something right outside of that. Very interesting. Um, okay, so moving along on the lightning bolt, scarcity is next. Tell us about scarcity. So scarcity and impatience is the core drive that says you want something just because you can't have it. So if grapes are on the table, you don't care about those grapes, but if they were just on a, uh, on a shelf above your reach, you're like, oh, you know, are those grapes even sweet? Can I have them? When can I have them, right? So you're always thinking about that. And this is, for instance, how, <clears throat> how Facebook started. At the beginning, Facebook says, this is only for Harvard students. And then it's, oh, only for a few Ivy League schools. And then when it opened to other schools, everyone wanted to join because they previously couldn't. And um, so that's the power of scarcity and exclusivity. And this is how a lot of games monetize these days, too. So sometimes you would go, you would go on a game like Farmville and say, well, this is kind of fun, but I'll never spend real money on a stupid game. And then it starts to dangle this mansion in front of you. And then you're like, wow, that's cool. I wonder what I need to do to get this mansion. Oh, man, I need to spend another 50 hours of farming to get it. That's a lot of farming. But wait, oh, I can just spend $5 and I can get the mansion immediately. $5 to save 50 hours of my time. That's a no-brainer. Right? So now you're no longer spending you know, $5 to buy some pixels on your screen. You're, you're spending $5 to buy to save your time. And so that's the power of scarcity, showing you something that you want, but not letting you get it and show you a narrow path there. And that creates a lot of engagement. So some people would argue, um, and of course Seamus is saying we need a psychologist to chime in on this subject. And, uh, and I think that's, that's actually true. We're going to get more psychologists in our mix. One of the questions that I have is some people argue that without scarcity, there's no actual like ability to move uh, people's motivation or an economy certainly forward, right? Core principle of econ economics, baby deal economics, there has to be some scarcity. Do we need scarcity in every one of these interactions from your experience? No, not necessarily. So some experiences are just fun because, well, there's always a little bit of scarcity because that's how the world is. Well, that's the, right. question. the world has right. the, the world is is limited. It's not. I mean, we're not talking about the physics in the universe. In the universe, but most things you can engage with is limited. Even social hang out. I was going to say hang out with friends. You know, you don't have to really think about scarcity. But you know, their time with you is limited. So that's a scarcity. You know, all party ends. So so you value it more. So there's always a little bit of scarcity in everything you do. But it's but in in and Octavius is really th thinking about how can you utilize and design for scarcity so that's and it's engaging because frankly abundance is a very boring thing abundance is not motivating right if you have if if that's that's why some some people are fil filthy rich and they don't know what to do so they go into drugs because there's just nothing to do anymore there's no scarcity um, um so yeah so i, I mean it's it's uh, definitely interesting right and something um something related to that is this next one which is unpredictability right so to some extent, you often see scarcity and unpredictability together. The idea that there's another item you could collect, but you don't know where it is or what it is. There's another room that you could maybe get access to, and you don't know what it is or where it is. Can you, can you talk more about unpredictability? Sure. Unpredictable curiosity is the core drive that says, because you don't know what's going to happen next, you're always thinking about it. 
So in a mild form, this is, you know, you want to read, finish a book, you want to finish, an, um, want to watch a movie. This is obviously heavily utilized in the gambling industry. And always when there's like a sweepstakes or a lottery system, it involves this core drive. And um, interestingly, this, the, the most well thrown around study of this core drive is the Skinner box. Do, do you think I need to quickly go over what the Skinner box is to your audience or? Well, you should just talk a little bit about that concept. Okay. Though, okay. So scientists have put, uh, have done an experiment where they put an animal in the box and there's a lever in the box. So the first experiment is that whenever the animal presses the lever, food comes out. And what you'll see is that the animal will press the lever until it's no longer hungry because it doesn't eat food anymore. It makes sense. But when you change the experiment to the point where whenever the animal presses the lever, food may or may not come out and sometimes to come out. What you'll see is that the animal constantly pressing the lever regardless if it's hungry or not because it's just messing with its brain. It's like, what will come out, what will come out, what will come out. Now, most people, like uh, critics of gamification, talk about how, oh, all these points and badges stuff, it's like putting people in your Skinner box. And that's actually inaccurate. You know, when we knew that points and badges are core drive too. The only thing that Skinner box proves is that when there's randomness and unpredictability, it drives obsessive behavior. So while, you know, while there, it is also related to gamification, it's actually incorrect when they say that that's what points and badges does, does to you. So, okay, so very interesting, right? The operant conditioning question and a little bit, of, but a little bit of unpredictability is very important, right? If you know literally everything that's going to happen in the future, just based on your action, that also would be boring, right? Most of the time, it's like, there, you could have other core drives, like sometimes watching a movie the fifth time is still interesting, but then it goes into other core drives, like relatedness, like, oh, you remember that feeling, or or you want to experience through that 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 social influence when when they first met whatever again. So so it it's not the lack of unpredictable doesn't assume it's going to be boring, but having it is is very useful in any system. So let's talk about the last one, which is avoidance. We've ended up at the Voldemort uh, category. Yes. So loss and avoidance very straightforward. You're doing something just because you want to avoid a loss. So you know there's nothing too much beyond that. It's it's really just hey. You know, I'm I'm doing this because I don't want to lose my job, and, and 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 that's what that's what a lot of companies face, right? Most of their employees are only motivated by ownership of possession, getting a paycheck, and loss and avoidance, not losing their job. So they only do enough work to to keep their jobs and, and get their paychecks. And so a lot of times it's useful to think, how can we bring more epic meaning and calling into into their motivation? How can we bring more development, accomplishment, empowerment, creative feedback? And I think so that's what. And it's a little on to a new topic, but that's why I think that's what Google did really well. The, the, the great thing Google did is, it is, it is they assume that every one of their employees either is an entrepreneur or wants to be an entrepreneur. No one has to be there if they didn't want to be there. So they, in the early days, they're designed, how do we make people want to be here at Google? So they did the epic meaning and calling part. They said, oh, we do no evil and we organize the world's org information. So an engineer might think, well, I can get a job anywhere. But at Google, I'm changing the world, and, and I'm one of the good guys. I want to be part of the good guys, right? And development accomplishment, you can't have every engineer become a manager. So they have seven levels, I think seven levels of engineer. You get, you get from level three engineer to your fourth engineer to your fourth, fifth one. Empowerment of creativity and feedback, 20% time. Right? It's like, well, I have some creative ideas, so I want to go start a company. But wait, I can do this. I can use my creativity within Google, and I don't have to take risks. That's great. And so, so you, you think about how do you add more of these core drives into an experience, and I think you can in, increase engagement in, in all types of company culture, your marketing, or product design. So help me understand, though, just on the subject of avoidance, and I think you're right overall about that in noctalysis. Okay. Um, you know, obviously, it's a, a unique and very powerful way of thinking about things. So just back to avoidance for one second. So if you're talking to somebody who's thinking about how to design uh, gamified experience, you know, um, and let, let's talk about employees because we've been on that subject. Okay. So we're trying to design a gamified experience to uh, raise employee engagement with training or raise employee engagement with their job. What's the avoidance motivator? What's the avoidance element of Octalysis and how might we use that as an example? So when it comes down to employees, you, ha you do have to be very careful with black hat gamification because we talked about Black hat gamification creates urgency. It makes people want to do things quickly, but they don't feel good. So when it comes to company culture employees, usually it's a good idea to think more in terms of the, the white hat stuff. Now, loss and avoidance, and I just want to make it more concrete, are things from a, from a small scale. It's like you know, on a website, instead of saying, hey, register to get 100 points, it'll say, hey, 
these are 100 points. You register to make sure you don't lose them. That's on a small scale of loss and avoidance. Then there's you know, an evanescent opportunity, which is something that an opportunity that disappears um, if you don't take action now. So if you're so those are things like, oh, this, 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 there's an expiration date to this opportunity. So now you're acting because you feel like you'd be losing an opportunity um, and you don't want that to happen. Even though, you, you, even though you never cared about it, if you feel like I might lose something, then that's, then that's, that's there. So, right. so this is there's, there's people talk about FOMO a lot. Right. So, and, and that's one of the things, by the way, uh, for those of you who uh, want to follow and stay in touch with you uh, beyond today, uh, you know, you can follow Yukai at, at Yukai Chow on Twitter, which is Y-U-K-A-I-C-H-O-U on Twitter. Um, so one of the questions about that, about loss avoidance, one of the interesting examples is, you know, uh, one of the classic things from loyalty program design and that, you know, has come forward a lot is this idea that until you are a top tier person in a loyalty program, you don't necessarily want it. But once you had it, you really don't want to lose it. There's something sure. kind of, what's interesting in most organizations don't really have an up and down design for a status or leveling, right? They don't really, you don't really go up and become a vice president and then go back down and become a director. It's sort of up or out or in some cases linearly. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how we might be able to make avoidance more constructive in that particular case? Can we create opportunities for people in a parallel world maybe that we're working on so that they can kind of go up and down and, and feel what that feels like? You really like it. Loss and avoidance, huh? <laughs> well, I, okay. I'm curious about it because I, I, I just, I just want to say I don't, I, I think it's very powerful. It's obviously a big yes, part it is, of it's very, what drives it is very behavior, powerful. right? So yeah. we, we do want to understand it. It's not that we need to focus on it, but I, I do think it's important to understand it and see oh, okay. how we might so use the it thing, positively. The thing, the thing about loss and avoidance is that the power of it is not to make people experience the loss; is to make people try to avoid the loss. So having them understand the loss can be there if they don't do the desired actions. And, and so therefore they, they avoid it. Now, to, to make it believable, again, believability is a huge thing in epic meaning calling as well as loss and avoidance. So to make it believable, you do have to execute on it when it happens. And so the question is, how do you not de completely demoralize a person? When you, you know, when you play a game, you, 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 you play it for 10 hours and you die, and you, you have to start all over. That's demoralizing, right? And generally, you know, it depends on what you're losing. A lot of times you're losing progress. You're losing, you're losing what you've built up to this point. It's, again, it's based on context. But more often than not, as a rule of thumb, if, if users probably lose a third of what they have got up to this point, they're going to feel demoralized. They don't want to start again. If they lose a little bit, it's all in comparison to what they have. So if they have a lot and they lose a little bit, they still don't feel good. They still try to avoid it. But you know, it doesn't really, it is still doesn't really make them want to stop. They still want to try hard. It's just, it's like, you play 10 hours, you lose, and you have backtracked five minutes, 10 minutes. Then you're like, okay, well, that sucked. I have to play the same 10 minutes again, but right. you'll still do it. Right, and so, game so levels that's, are sort of, and, and often game, uh, you know, like reset levels are designed kind of in that way, right? Like you, you're you progressing through a particular level and then you know, so your character dies. You don't go all the way back to the beginning. Uh, sometimes you go to a set point in between or if you're doing really much smaller levels. So one of the interesting opportunities is to figure out how to bring some of that stuff, I think, to environments where normally we don't let people fail and we don't really let them. So, uh, and and I, I, can, I can tell you an example of, of loss and, well, you know, that happens a lot in actually investing in gambling. Like sometimes you're playing poker and you know as a fact the other person has your hand beat. You know, you're almost 100% sure, but you have so much money on the table. You're like, ah, you know, what if he has a smaller hand? And so you're like, what if he has a smaller hand? And then so you're like, in order to, to, to not lose the money you already have on the table, you do something irrational, which is pushing all your money. And then you lose, and lo and behold, he has a bigger hand and you lose all your money. And I've actually got stuck in a situation with loss and avoidance before when I was doing a talk in, uh, in China. Um, and this is nothing about China. I think it happens a lot. So, so some, so um, I was traveling in China, and there's this guy who draws pictures, and with, you know, and then I'm like, hey, can you? I, I wasn't interested, but then the guy, then I saw someone else giving a photo. I'm like, hey, that's a great gift to bring back to my wife. So I showed him a picture of my wife. Said, can you draw my wife? And he's like, okay, sure. It's like, I don't know, equivalent of twenty-five dollars, which is kind of expensive in China. Sure. So he drew it out, and it's done, and. He says, do you want me to add a protective layer on top of it? I said, sure. He says, well, it's going to cost more. I'm like, how much more? He says, well, $15 more. And I said, uh, no, then I don't want it. He says, but look, 
the, the, the pencil mark, it's going to smear. Look, it's going to smear. If you put it in your, if you put it in your luggage, it's going to, it's going to all be ruined up. That's, that's such a shame. And so I got put in a spot where I either had to pay him a $15 more than what I wanted to or lose everything, pretty much lose the, the photo or whatever, the paint, the, the drawing. And again, incredibly powerful motivation. I gave him an extra $15, but I do not feel good. So I do not want to interact with him again. So that's the thing about black gamification again. Drives urgency, drives motivation, doesn't make users feel good. And that, that happens a lot in a lot of places. So the key is, can we, the, the key thing to unlock would be how could we figure out a way that uh, makes us kind of feel better about some of those decisions. Yeah, so it's a balance of white hat gamification. So here's a, great, here's a great example that happened recently. So my friend made a game called Battlecam, very, very powerful in terms of motivation. So in Battlecam, you have a team of 25 people fighting a boss. And you have to fight this boss for eight hours. You know, it's just log in, log out, and you have energy every hour. Um, and when it's seven hours and 30 minutes, you, the boss is still at 25% health. You realize we're going to lose this battle. You have two choices. One is to lose, and everyone wastes you know, eight hours of their time, so 25 times eight hours time wasted. Or you pay some money and kill the boss. So now, again, you're felt, you feel you're held hostage. Either pay money or lose everyone's time. So what a lot of people do is, obviously, it sucks to lose, so they pay. They pay the money. They get the super powerful weapon. They kill the boss. And again, even though they won, they feel bad, right? They're, they're not like, yay, I killed the boss. They feel like they were forced to spend the money. However, this is when the game really reinforces all the white hat stuff. You know, it says, congratulations, you just killed the boss. That's a huge achievement. All your friends are like, your teammates are like, wow, you're a hero. You help, you, you spend money to save our troop. You're amazing. You know, and it's like, wow, you did all that. So now like, hey, I guess that was kind of cool. I guess uh, that, was, that was money pretty well spent. And now you're open to doing that again. So again, when you do black hat stuff, you have to make sure you make people feel good with white hat. You have to balance it out, and or else, get an or opportunity else, for right for them to to uh, have an epic win, for example. Um, yeah. You know, the fascinating stuff. You kind of, obviously from the chat. If you've been watching the chat with everyone who joined us today, there's amazing interest. There's so many questions. Such great examples. It's been really amazing to have you here. Thank you so much for being with us. And uh, for those of you who want to continue the conversation, because you know we could talk about this for hours. You have an opportunity to talk about this for hours with Yukai. If you come to G Summit June 10th through the 13th, join Yukai uh, for his hands-on lab on Octalysis. You get to get more information, spend time with him, with the rest of us, catch all the other great speakers, hands-on labs and workshops that are going on. You can register now and save $200 at the conference by using the code GAMREV, G-A-M-R-E-V, for folks uh, at the Gamification Revolution. I want to thank you all for being here. Many of you have noticed this was a different day in time. We're doubling up on Gamification Revolution uh, webinars between now and G Summit to, so that you get a chance to see so many more of our speakers. So Tuesdays and Thursdays from now through June, uh, you can join us here uh, for extended Gamification Revolution webinars. Yukai, thank you so much. I hope everyone gets a chance to meet you and follow you between now and then. And for the Here's rest of the you, G Summit is where it's at. Woohoo! So exciting. And uh, for the rest of you, thanks so much for joining us, y'all. We'll see you in a couple of days. In the meantime, I'm Gabe Zickerman. Have fun. Take care.